you know, Bitcoin went from zero to about $45,000 when these ETFs launched on the back of retail self-directed investors. But those folks only hold about 20% of the wealth in America. You could think of the ETF launch as Bitcoin's IPO that opened it up to the other 80% of the wealth. You know, it's a huge amount of money, tens of trillions of dollars that for the first time in history have the ability to buy the best performing asset over the last three, five, 10 and 15 years. It's no surprise that that money is coming in. It's Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024, and this is Markets Daily, where we get into the minds of the smartest and most experienced investors, traders, and analysts. I'm Helene Braun, markets reporter at Coindesk. Let's have a quick look at the market before we get into today's show. As per Coindesk indices at 8 a.m. Eastern Time, it appears that the majority of crypto assets have modestly rebounded from yesterday's lows. Bitcoin was up about 1% over the past 24 hours, currently trading at $66,104. Ether is also trading slightly higher by about 0.7% at $3,323. The Coin S20 index, which tracks the top 20 assets in the market, is up by about 1.5% as some of the altcoins are showing significant gains this morning, especially Solana, which is up nearly 5%. With the jobs report due on Friday, Chair Jerome Powell, along with several other Fed speakers, is scheduled to make remarks later today. So let's bring our guests on, which is none other than Matt Hogan, Chief Investment Officer at Bitwise. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, Helene. Glad to be here. Matt, the SPA Bitcoin ETFs traded $111 billion in March, which is three times the amount that it traded in January and February. Is this volume a result of Bitcoin's all-time high, or is the all-time high a result of the ETFs? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a tough question. I think they're certainly related. You know, Bitcoin is a unique asset in that it's reflexive. The higher it goes, the more people get interested in it. I think that is one of the big effects. But the second one is just ETFs move on ETF time, not on crypto time. In crypto, we're used to things happening over days and weeks. In traditional finance, it's months and quarters. I think the strong volumes just indicate that traditional finance is getting its hands around these Bitcoin ETFs. I actually expect it to continue and maybe accelerate in the second half of the year. So both things are true, but uh, don't look for the ETFs to slow down anytime soon. What do you believe were the key factors behind the success of these ETFs? And I guess, to what extent do you think their success can be credited to BlackRock being one of the issuers? BlackRock certainly helps. Having these big names and huge voices in the industry lifts all boats. And not just BlackRock, there are other great companies as well. Fidelity, Invesco, et cetera. This puts a sort of TradFi stamp of approval on Bitcoin, which is really valuable for the space. But the big reason is the simplest one. You know, Bitcoin went from zero to about $45,000 when these ETFs launched on the back of retail self-directed investors. But those folks only hold about 20% of the wealth in America. You could think of the ETF launch as Bitcoin's IPO that opened it up to the other 80% of the wealth. You know, it's a huge amount of money, tens of trillions of dollars that for the first time in history have the ability to buy the best performing asset over the last three, five, 10 and 15 years. It's no surprise that that money is coming in. Sure, it's, it's exceeded expectations to a degree, but we knew this was going to be a big deal. And again, I think this is going to build year over year for at least a couple of years as that you know 80 percent of the wealth really gets at hand around what bitcoin is so bitcoin has been extremely volatile though ever since it hit its all-time high at the beginning of march just yesterday it dropped about six percent in just 24 hours i believe what do you attribute these ups and downs to yeah, it's a, it's a story as old as time in crypto which is you know it's it's people using derivatives on top of a bull market that get blown out on either side, up and down. But if you zoom out, what's been happening is Bitcoin has been trading in a pretty fixed channel between 60 and $70,000. 
I think we're trying to sort of work off the excess inventory that's available at $70,000 before we move higher. I suspect that that will happen over time. I wouldn't worry about Bitcoin unless it sort of broke below that $60,000 level. Sure, it's day-to-day -day volatile, but again, if you scan out, it's really just a, sand, a channelized sideways trend. And I think long-term, the ETF demand will lift us over that previous all-time high and send us sort of careening up toward $100,000. Let's talk about GBTC here for a second, which is still seeing heavy outflows, overall a little over $15 billion in total. If you were Grayscale's chief investment officer, would you start getting worried here? <laughs> I, it's hard to put myself in the shoes of a competitor, much less a, a, an excellent company like Grayscale. You know, they're in a unique situation of coming into this market with billions of dollars of assets at a relatively high fee product. And I completely understand the economic rationale. I think from an investor's perspective, it's wonderful that people have choice. They have low cost products like BITB at just 20 basis points. They have large established products like GBTC. You're naturally going to see money flow into the low cost products. And I know Grayscale is thinking about what to do next. But again, if you zoom out, this is a very healthy market. Despite the outflows from GBTC, we've seen you know well north of $12 billion flow into these ETFs. I think there's a secondary move where we're going to see you know, another $12 billion plus flow in once we open up national account platforms and everyone is going to do well. All of the issuers in this game are going to increase their AUM and have additional success. Do you think it's too late for Grayscale to lower fees on GBTC now? Do you think if they lower the fees in the, co in the coming months or weeks that they can still see similar inflows to what your or Bit Bitwise's fund, for example, is seeing? Yeah, you know, when I think about sort of drawing lessons from ETF history, and there are plenty of examples like this in ETF history, where there is a relatively high fee established product and multiple low fee products, what you see is if issuers going after different channels, right? At Bitwise, we're really going after a crypto native channel. We do things like donate 10% of the proceeds of our ETF back to Bitcoin core developers, disclose our Bitcoin address, provide substantial support for advisors who want additional education around Bitcoin. BlackRock may be going after sort of the brand name channel, carrying that BlackRock stamp of approval into the space. That's going to find an audience. And you have Grayscale, which is using significant marketing dollars and its existing liquidity to find its channel. I suspect that's what you're going to see is people digging into their own channels and trying to grow sort of their native space and again, I think there's space for three or four or five. Look, GBTC is still a very large fund in the market, and I think they will be successful going forward. Grayscale is a great firm. I think Bitwise's place in the market is strong and established and growing as well. And of course, BlackRock and Fidelity are also major players. So different ETFs for different end customers. And I think that's a huge win for end investors. They have a lot of choice in this space. So Bitwise is one of the applicants for an Ether ETF as well. Now, the industry is so hopeful that we're going to see an approval in May, but you said yesterday that you hope that doesn't happen, which sort of sounds to me like you know more than us and you're trying to, you know, prepare the market uh, for what's to come in May. But explain to me where this is coming from. Sure. To be clear, I can't speak about Bitwise's particular filing because it's live at the SEC. Sure. But zooming out to talk about Ether in general, sort of for my ETF expert days. What I see in the field is traditional finance is still digesting the Bitcoin ETF. We haven't even seen approvals of the Bitcoin ETFs on major national account platforms like Morgan Stanley and UBS and Wells Fargo. It takes a while for Wall Street to digest something as big, as important as a Bitcoin ETF. I think if you inject an Ethereum ETF into the conversation now, it will actually confuse people. Do I buy this one? Do I buy that one? Let me do due diligence on Ethereum. I think from a market perspective, we'll get more flows into crypto ETFs if we allow Wall Street time to digest Bitcoin and then move on to Ethereum later down the road. Now. I don't know what the SEC is going to do, and I wasn't meaning to sort of project what will happen in May. I, I don't know. I'm not in charge. 
Uh, but what I'm saying is from a market perspective, being in the field, talking to financial advisors, talking to family offices, talking to these national account platforms, they need more months to sort of wrap their heads around Bitcoin ETFs if we want Ethereum ETFs to really have their moment in the sun and grow like I think they could if they're 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 launched, you know, at the right time. But we'll see. So what are some of the steps that issuers are taking as the first deadline for the SEC approaches to sort of strengthen the case for an Ether ETF? Is there anything? Sure. I mean, I think if you look through the filings, you've seen a lot of issuers, Bitwise included, provide a lot of statistical analysis, right? This isn't sort of like a magic sorting hat at the SEC where they reach in and decide yes or no. Uh, they're looking at the data and the data is quite interesting. They're applying sort of, you know, what we saw in the Bitcoin ETFs into the Ethereum space and seeing how it lines up. So I do think you're seeing a high quality data put forward into the space. And behind the scenes, you're starting to see them update prospectuses and make amendments. That's the kind of progress you want to see. It's never the case when you apply for an ETF, not in crypto. In general, it's never the case that you just send in a prospectus and they're like, great, perfect, Matt. You did it great the first time. They want you to edit it and shape it. So that's what to be looking for is to, is to see those edits come through. But I will say, zooming out again, the statistical data is very strong. I do think eventually we will get an Ethereum ETF. And I think that will be great for investors. Just like the Bitcoin ETF, increased access, you know, gave peace of mind and dramatically lowered costs. An Ethereum ETF would do those things. It would be great for American investors. We should root for it. And I think we'll get there. It's just a matter of, is it May? Is it later? And we'll find out. Finally, let's switch to macro for a second. Powell is slated to speak this afternoon. What are your expectations for his speech? Do you anticipate a reiteration of previous statements or do you think he's going to hint at whether a rate cut is on the horizon for June? Yeah, you know, what we've been seeing in the Fed fund futures market is it's been slowly softening its expectations for rate cuts in the future. I think if we scale back a month ago, it was pricing in 50 basis points of rate cuts by the summer. Now it's more like 25 base points. I think we've seen some relatively strong uh, economic data. So probably to a degree, you know, he'll talk about being data driven and noting the the emergent strength in the American economy on the margin. That will be slightly challenging for crypto and other risk assets because they sort of want the Fed to cut rates aggressively. But I will say this. I think what determines Bitcoin's price going forward is not actually the Fed. It may influence where it trades in that channel we talked about between 70 and 60 thousand dollars because of sentiment. But what's going to determine if we go below 60 or above 70 are the flows into the ETFs, the Bitcoin having and the end demand. The Fed is really fiddling at the edges. It's still valuable. I'll still be watching the speech to be sure, because I care about where we are in that channel. But if we're talking about how do we get to $100,000, look at the flows into the ETFs, look at approval at national account platforms and wait for the impact of the having to reduce new supply and have that filter into the market. That's the real story. The Fed thing is, is sort of a short-term trader's game. All right, Matt, thank you so much for being on today's show. Thanks for having me, this was great. Again, that was Matt Hogan, Chief Investment Officer at Bitwise. And that's it for today's show. If you like this episode, or if you have a question that you'd like us to ask on the next show, please leave a comment wherever you're listening or watching. Until then, tune in every day to get your latest markets news from me, Helene Braun, and my co-host, Jensen Assey.